Welcome back to yet another Believe to See bonus episode. As a reminder, the Anselm Society's big Imagination Redeemed conference is nearly here. It's happening September 24th and September 25th at Glen Erie in Colorado Springs. And yes, the rumors are true. Glen Erie is an actual castle. Uh, If we have any tickets left by the time this posts, they'll be in very short supply. So hop on and try to get them as soon as possible. Uh, To celebrate our conference, we've been posting memorable talks from our past conferences. This talk comes from 2020. As you may possibly remember, things went a little crazy in 2020, so we had to move our conference online that year. And this online talk is really wonderful. It's by our own Amy Lee. Amy is a recurring guest on our podcast and also one of the leaders of Anselm's Arts Guild. And as you'll see, she is an incredibly talented and insightful writer. Um, As any great Anselm talk should, uh, this one focuses on J.R.R. Tolkien and The Lord of the Rings. It's about the struggle we all face when we dream of creating the elven art of Rivendell, even though we're actually just a mud-covered peasant in Rohan. Again, this is Amy Lee at our 2020 online conference. The title of the talk is Creating Art in the Time of War. Enjoy! I'm Amy Lee, and this is From Rivendell to Rohan, Creating Art in the Time of War. Before we begin, the word art in this session is meant to refer to creative endeavors of all kinds. Writing, sculpting, painting, songwriting, metalsmithing, gardening, all that kind of thing. And I'd also like to clarify, because I grew up in academia and I have trouble slipping away sometimes, that this is not an academic talk. I am not a scholarly expert on Tolkien, much as I'd love to be, and this session is given simply from the vantage point of a writer moving through Middle-earth. So, we're going to begin at the Green Dragon Inn. I've heard tell that elves are moving west. They are sailing, sailing, sailing over the sea. They are going into the west and leaving us, said Sam, half chanting the words, shaking his head sadly and solemnly. He believed he had once seen an elf in the woods, and still hoped to see more one day. Of all the legends that he had heard in his early years, such fragments of tales and half-remembered stories about the elves as the hobbits knew had always moved him most deeply. Sometime in the spring of 2003, I met a new classmate for lunch on the terrace of our university's dining hall. In the course of our conversation, she asked me an innocuous question, a kind discussion starter. Which character from The Lord of the Rings do you identify with the most? It should have been easy to answer, but I was caught off guard by all the thoughts that came to mind. The Lord of the Rings was and still is the story of all fictional stories in the world in which I feel most at home. So I said, quite shyly, not knowing how much to share. I'd like to identify with Arwen, but I don't think that accurately reflects the life I've been given. It ought to be Eowyn, and I think I'm beginning to make my peace with that. Amazingly enough, my new friend sat through the whole subsequent pondering and is one of my closest and dearest friends to this day. But apparently I shared those thoughts elsewhere, too, because at the end of that year, our Bible study girls made a scrapbook that contained a picture and a nickname for each member. Mine was the Shield Maiden. They had photoshopped my face onto Miranda Otto's tall, blonde, bell-sleeved form. It is an image that will haunt me for the rest of my life. But even beyond that unfortunate but dear scrapbook, for the past 17 or so years, that question on the terrace has returned with the regularity of a comet coursing through my thoughts. Because that conversation was, and is, about beauty at its core, and the seemingly incompatible hard facts of daily life. Since that day, in cycles, the comparison between these two female characters has actually helped me to consider various aspects of my own life, as a woman, along with issues of femininity, as a third culture kid, and as an artist. It's that last aspect that is relevant to this session. And that story begins with the two cultures of these women, the elves and men of Middle-earth. As a 17-year-old reading The Lord of the Rings for the first time, I was drawn to the elves the way Sam was drawn to them. 
If I'd had to put words to it at the time, I probably would have said it was their nobility, their luminous influence, and their beauty that called to me the most. I first came into the Valley of Rivendell at a time of great change in my own life, and I did not want to leave. Frodo was now safe in the last homely house east of the sea, begins the reposeful, oft-quoted description. That house was, as Bilbo had long ago reported, a perfect house, whether you like food or sleep or storytelling or singing or just sitting and thinking best or a pleasant mixture of them all. Merely to be there was a cure for weariness, fear, and sadness. In the Hall of Fire at Rivendell, Frodo listens to the music and the tales of the elves, and here's the description. At first, the beauty of the melodies and of the interwoven words in elven tongues, even though he understood them but little, held him in a spell as soon as he began to attend to them. Almost it seemed that the words took shape and visions of far lands and bright things that he had never yet imagined opened out before him, and the firelit hall became like a golden mist above seas of foam that sighed upon the margins of the world. As I read this and passages like them, for perhaps the first time in my life, I glimpsed a beauty that dared to exist in richness without apology, and yet drew from sober depths that I could sense, even if I couldn't completely fathom them. They seem a bit above my likes and dislikes, so to speak, in the words of Sam Wise. It don't seem to matter what I think about them. They are quite different from what I expected, so old and young, and so gay and sad, as it were. That gravitas and beauty came through to me in the songs and the speech of the elves. And in fact, Tolkien's letters reveal to us the essence of the elves' nature and artistry, the way that um, he subcreated them. The elves represent, as it were, the artistic, aesthetic, and purely scientific aspects of the humane nature raised to a higher level than is actually seen in men. They also possess a subcreational or artistic faculty of great excellence. Elsewhere, he says, their magic is art, delivered from many of its human limitations, more effortless, more quick, more complete, product and vision in unflawed correspondence. And its object is art, not power, subcreation, not domination, and tyrannous reforming of creation. So Humphrey Carpenter sums all this up and says, they are to all intents and purposes men, or rather they are man before the fall which deprived him of his powers of achievement. They are craftsmen, poets, scribes, creators of works of beauty, far surpassing human artifacts. Most important of all, they are, unless slain in battle, immortal. Old age, disease, and death do not bring their work to an end while it is still unfinished or imperfect. They are therefore the ideal of every artist. The elves make beauty and they are careful to preserve it. Their three rings, for instance, are operative in preserving the memory of the beauty of old, Tolkien says maintaining enchanted enclaves of peace where time seems to stand still and decay is restrained, a semblance of the bliss of the true West. From the time I was a child, I rewatched movies to experience their setting. I revisited books for the solace of their richest and loveliest scenes. I replayed songs to call back where I was when I first truly heard them, and I still do these things. I resonated well with the desire to accomplish, treasure, and preserve. And as I grew, and I hoped that beauty had something to do with God, I discovered that what I was best fit for was cobbling words together. I wanted my storytelling to have an effect. I remember telling a teacher once, flat out, that I wanted to make people cry, which at the time was the closest I could come to saying I wanted this, this small thing that I could do to be an element of truthfully portraying a glorious and praiseworthy God. Though I've only been able to articulate it now in my 30s, the love of the elves and my desire to offer Christ something of worth were one and the same. But it did not take me long to realize that, unlike the refuge of Rivendell, this is not the perfect place or time to create. That doesn't even need to be said, you know this already, but I'd like to take a closer look at what that might mean. So here, the execution of a completed idea will never, or rarely, if ever, 
match the vision. It will often be imperfect. Have you ever felt that difference? Sometimes I can hardly get myself to start on the projects that matter most to me because I know that they will fall short. Anthony Doerr, the author, in a recent interview, described this from the perspective of a writer, and this is what he said. We're using these fungible, man-made, agreed-upon things that are words, and we're trying, I'm trying, to mimic the eternal, infinite beauty I see in the starry sky at night. You're always fumbling after it. Your words are always going to be inexact and only partially precise. Together with the reader, you work in this kind of ballet to build this imaginative thing that lives between you. And that's an incredibly beautiful and human thing, but it's never going to be as good as my original, unsullied, unwritten version of a book. Each time you even try to make a sentence, it's always a little surprising and inaccurate and faulty. That makes it a lifelong art. That makes it a beautiful, hopeful thing each time you sit down and you're like, this time, maybe I'll be a little better than last time. But ultimately, you can never say, I wrote the thing that I saw. I think it's striking how common this experience is. In the wake of the fall, even the figurative ground of our creation is cursed to exact toil from us and yield little in return. On top of that, we're always interrupted by, by life. Tolkien's own diary entries involved tasks like mowing the lawn and being worried about his children being sick and various things that had to be done around the house. That reminds me a little bit of the character Parrish from his short story, Leaf by Niggle, who is always dropping by to request something or to send his neighbor Niggle on an errand because his wife is sick. And interruptions like those are myriad in our lives. No one is immune. Also, we meet with resistance not only with the people we know will probably reject our work, but also the ones whom we hope will accept us and find kindred connection and welcome. Every artist has stories of criticism, sometimes helpful and sometimes ridiculous. And Tolkien himself said, when The Lord of the Rings was published, that he had now exposed his heart to be shot at. I love that he said that, and I... The first time I heard it, my heart almost bounded out of my chest. I just felt so much in sympathy with that feeling. Anytime I put my words out in front of anybody else, that is definitely how it feels. And other hindrances that might come our way as we create are doubt. Doubt can get in the way constantly, and even not just doubt over the specific project that we're working on, but doubt over the veracity of the worldview that we hold. Physical disabilities can get in the way. One of the things that I struggle with most is anxiety um, that threatens a stranglehold sometimes. And I've always struggled with it. And there are days that, that I wish I could just strip it off like a dragon skin. But these are only a few examples. And perhaps as a summation of all these things, our mortality gets in the way, along with all that it betokens. Frailty, despair, disease, grief, and all the efforts that we must make to hold these at bay while we do what we can in the brief time that we have. These are the costs. Our home in the world at present looks far less like an enchanted enclave and more like a realm at war. So in Middle Earth, about a two months journey from Rivendell as the Hobbit runs or is abducted lies Rohan. It is a warrior culture made up of Homeric horsemen, as Tolkien called them, based in part on the Anglo-Saxon culture and in full on the northern heroic spirit of Germanic peoples. They are described, the people of Rohan, as a fell people who sing fair and terrible songs as they battle. They are honorable, brave, stern, acquainted with loss. And Eowyn is no exception. Strong she seemed and stern as steel, a daughter of kings. She is also described as fearless and high-hearted. And when she heard of the battle in Helm's Deep and the great slaughter of their foes and of the charge of Theoden and his knights, then her eyes shone. The heritage of the Rohirrim is so intertwined with war that their concept of honor is bound together with the manner of their fighting. When Theoden and Aragorn are pushed back to the citadel at Helm's Deep, the king becomes restless. I fret in this prison said Theoden. If I could have set a spear in rest, riding before my men upon the field, 
Maybe I could have felt again the joy of battle and so ended. But I serve little purpose here. The end will not be long. But I will not end here, taken like an old badger in a trap. When dawn comes, I will bid men sound Helm's horn, and I will ride forth. Will you ride with me then, son of Erethorn? Maybe we shall cleave a road, or make such an end as will be worth a song, if any be left to sing of us hereafter. The willingness of the Rohirrim to face down a harrowing threat with a ride to the death partially reflects their geographic placement. Rohan is a middle kingdom in Middle-earth during the War of the Ring, it's a country caught between the advance of evil from the east, another threat and insidious deception from the west, and treachery from within. And we are not so different. Like them, we are beset on all sides. On a personal level, while reading the Psalms, I have often felt that the enemies who seek my death are unseen, and they often come in inward ways. It's been a very curious experience to look around these days and see that many of those things that have hounded me are now hounding the world at large. Or perhaps they've been doing so in hidden places all along and now we can see it. But whether we're in the midst of a pandemic or not, we grapple with the bounds of our mortality. For we are a middle kingdom too, at war. Ephesians 6 details the armor of God and exhorts us to stand firm. Paul encourages Timothy to fight the good fight of the faith. Romans 8 states that right now, all created life groans in a sort of universal travail. Eugene Peterson puts it concisely in his book, Reversed Thunder. We do not live in a benign or neutral world. There is malign opposition and evil will at work to deceive and destroy us. But there is apparently nothing to fear in the act of fighting. Danger here is all in the not fighting. The safest place is on the battlefield, for it is there that Christ is active, riding the white horse. To fight is to engage in the ordinary work of the saints, to make way for the work that God is accomplishing. So if this is where we are in the midst of a war, our situation changes the working out of our calling as artists. Recognizing and acknowledging where we stand is, as they say, half the battle. Tolkien once made an observation that helps me contrast Rivendell directly with Rohan. He wrote, Elrond symbolizes throughout the ancient wisdom, and his house represents lore, the preservation and reverent memory of all tradition concerning the good, wise, and beautiful. It is not a scene of action, but of reflection. Thus, it is a place visited on the way to all deeds or adventures. I would still love to reside in Rivendell, to be a doorkeeper there. And it is vital that we have way stations like these. At the same time, we cannot forget the follow me command of Christ, the active doing and laboring that he calls us to, the praying, the fighting and the running that Paul gives us as analogies. Even when we are not directly engaged in these movements, we are asked to have the willingness to do them, to do what is difficult. So as hungry as my heart may be for rest and unhampered joy and reflection and the ability to create without hindrance, right now it has been drafted to take up arms. For the artist Christian then, living in wartime means that what we create now must be of a different tenor. The problems I mentioned before, our difficulties in executing the ideas that we have, our interruptions, our doubts, our anxieties, the criticism and censure that we meet, and our mortality, we will always have those with us on this earth. So then, what does that mean for the art that we create? I believe that there are three things, at least, that might help equip us as we approach our desks and our instruments and our studios. First is the knowledge that art must address the brokenness of our world. It must tell the truth. The fall, the curse, the enormity of it, the ground of our redemption. All of us are subject to the boundaries of the children of Adam and Eve now, the same boundaries to which Christ subjected himself when he became to begin reversing the effects of the ancient curse. This point has been addressed pretty well elsewhere, so I won't spend any more time on it, but I can elaborate a little bit more during Q&A if you'd like. 
So we must address the brokenness, but not just brokenness at large. Even before we begin putting our hand to beauty and to making, we must address our own brokenness. For one, as artists, we cannot allow ourselves to be consumed by bitterness. One significant, fascinating detail about Eowyn is that when Tolkien first envisioned and shaped her, initially as a character, well, there was another woman character in Rohan with her who later kind of faded away, but Eowyn was originally an Amazon, a woman warrior who rode openly into battle. It was only as the landscape of the story and the culture of Rohan changed, and only when her character was relegated to finding food and beds and watching the men leave constantly for battle, that Eowyn took on her trademark bitterness and coldness. She was not permitted to participate. For Eowyn, bereft of the security of being truly seen and the chance to serve a purpose according to her ability, renown in battle becomes paramount. She believes that's going to be the only way she can matter. In her conversation with Aragorn at Dunharrow, which I regrettably don't have time to read, she mentions renown three times, along with honor, victory, and great deeds. The means of attaining these things? Peril, battle, ride, wield blade. Her strength is channeled into bitterness amid the context of war, shaped by what she perceives is the only way. This is strikingly similar to how many artists may feel in the church at times. We are not immune to the same misunderstanding. When there is no clear way to live out our part in times of crisis and the battles at hand, when we can find no place to contribute in the kingdom, we may become convinced that the only tolerable way to go is to branch off on our own, to go rogue, to win our own praise somewhere else, somewhere out there, because perhaps this way we will somehow come to be known enough to feel accepted. But countless artists, living and dead, can tell us that renown for renown's sake is an empty search, an empty quest, that ultimately doesn't yield life. Another aspect of our brokenness to watch for is our own propensity as artists for veering off and trying to possess what is not ours. This was the downfall of the elves in the Silmarillion. As Tolkien noted with piercing perspicacity, the sub-creator can become possessive, clinging to the things made as its own. The sub-creator wishes to be the Lord and God of his private creation. And that may be our downfall as well, if we claim to be the absolute source of origin for our work, or if we take upon ourselves an illegitimate mantle and say that our work counts for more than it is, when really what it is, is a service offered to our king. There is potential for us to twist and distort our role as artists, then, if we don't take care to remember that we are both part of the body of Christ and that we are truly sub-creators. Secondly, engaging in the fight of the artist Christian means seeing true reality with renewed eyes. That is part of why we are here at this conference, trying to see with re-enchanted eyes, not because we need the novelty of a different perspective and still less an escape, but because we know how easily our vision can cloud over. For what re-enchantment means in this context is the ability to grasp what is going on in the present beyond what is visible to a cursory glance, which is something that only God himself can show us, if he will. I love, I'm captivated thinking of Elisha's servants seeing the chariots of fire as the Syrians are coming against them. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And the Hebrews 12 passage about coming to a kingdom that cannot be shaken. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels and festal gathering is how it begins. It sounds like a passage out of a myth or a legend or a chanson de geste, but this is not inflated speech. What the writer of Hebrews is showing us here is really what is happening around us. Malcolm Geith's latest Easter poem, Easter 2020, is a heartening example of this for me. I have a stanza from it to share with you. He might have been a wafer in the hands of priests this day, or music from the lips of red-robed choristers. Instead, he slips away from church, shakes off our linen bands to don his apron with a nurse. He grips and lifts a stretcher, soothes with, with gentle hands the frail flesh of the dying, gives them hope, 
breathes with the breathless, lends them strength to cope. I read that first on a day when I desperately needed to see where my Lord was. But if we are to do this right, um, if we are to convey the reality that is going on, uh, which is a responsibility that we bear, it can't be something that's based on our conjectures, but on the Word of God. Eugene Peterson, again from Reverse Thunder, says, The warrior Messiah has a single weapon, his word. He wages war by what he says, which is an articulation of who he is. This is the identical war that St. Paul found himself in. We battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. We who accompany Jesus across the mountains and through the valleys of salvation are permitted no other weapons. His word is the only offensive weapon in the armor of God and in the hand of the artist. Knowing it well is the only way we will be able to see and to convey clearly. And this links well to our third point, which is if we have a firm hold on both reality seen and unseen, art can help inestimably to make the connection between the lives that we are living and their effect in the eternal realm, between this pain and that glory, between this joy and the greater. One of the central truths of the Lord of the Rings, according to Tolkien, is that without the high and the noble, the simple and vulgar is utterly mean, and without the simple and ordinary, the noble and heroic is meaningless. Mary says something like this to Pippin in The Houses of Healing. He says, it is best to love first what you are fitted to love, I suppose. You must start somewhere and have some roots, and the soil of the Shire is deep. Still, there are things deeper and higher, and not a gaffer could tend his garden in what he calls peace but for them, whether he knows about them or not. I am glad that I know about them a little. We need to be able to hold both the ordinary and the high reality at the same time, for we are caught up in both. And the gift and the burden of the artist Christian is to relay that connection so that someone else's vision is strengthened and clarified enough for them to go on. How does that work on a practical level as an artist? I think one of the most effective ways is to figure out how God has been drawing you to him in your life. You identify the images, the statements, the scenes, the snatches of song, the truths that move and stir you, and you track down what that is, what has been drawing you to those things in his word, what the source and the grounds of that might be there. And that's not merely to give it biblical clout and validation, but because there's often far more there than you might have guessed. It's often the tip of a wide iceberg with a long history to it. Those deeper truths are why some of our most beloved emblematic elements have endured. Sam's white star, the gray havens, a lamppost in a snowy wood. And then you pass that element on in whatever medium you use having its context in hand for anyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have. And who you do that for and when and how are individual matters of obedience specific to each life. I have often been enabled to go on by artists who have reminded me through elements like those that I am living in a wide story that involves a serpent and a high king and a dragon and a rescuer and humble deeds done with honor, valor, beauty and faith. This just happened to me this past week, in fact, with Andrew Peterson's quarantine edition of his album Resurrection Letters. But other places as well. Tolkien, Lewis, Betsy and Corey Tinboom, Elizabeth Googe, Gerard Manley Hopkins, Brian Doyle, Matthew Clark, Teresa Mahoney, Sarah Groves. There are so many contemporary artists and writers. And some people lend me courage simply by the way they live like Lancia Smith, whom you'll hear at the end of this conference. Their very presence is a reminder of the import of these days, because they live it. They have helped me to weep when I am grieving, and then dry my tears and walk on. They have reminded me that when I write, I am also writing for people who are struggling to keep their heads above a flood of fear, or insignificance, or plain exhaustion. When we create as people who are mindful that we live and breathe on a battlefield, then we are always in touch with motifs that run through the whole of history and humanity. And that means our work will always involve an awareness of the fall and our mortality 
and the story of redemption at the center of it all. It is not a simple task. So much of creating in these times, especially in this current season, feels like a grief-stricken swinging of the sword. But art can stir the wounded to one more push. It can heal the poison of long-held, long-digested lies by making the truth, beauty, and goodness of God apparent where it seemed that there was no longer any basis for hope. It can help us keep our heads on straight when the road leads downward and all of it looks like a terribly long defeat. Last year, it took me a while to comprehend that so much in our earthbound lives and so much in the trajectory of mankind is a long defeat. I don't know why, but I fought that notion so hard. And in some ways, like Theoden, I'd rather go out in a blaze of thunder rather than watch the ones I love suffer and walk the long road myself. But Sarah Groves has a song called The Long Defeat that helped me both to admit my need for help again and to remember that uncertainty is the place that makes way for a divine mercy to appear. And a few lyrics from her song go like this. I have joined the long defeat, that falling set in motion. All my strength and energy are raindrops in the ocean. So conditioned for the win to share in Victor's stories. But in the place of ambition's din, I've heard of other glories. We walk a while, we sit and rest, we lay it on the altar. I won't pretend to know what's next, but what I have, I've offered. Her song is itself inspired by a passage by Tolkien, and together the two compelled me to write a post last February about grief as we were losing somebody in our extended family, and new catastrophe, and the hope-giving work of the saints. Writing that short piece and hearing back about it from reader friends made me realize again how hungry we all are for a way to acknowledge the darkness that is abroad in the world without flinching, and also uphold, point for point, the declaration that it cannot stop the light of the world from piercing through in our every hour of need. Now, having talked about the necessity of art in the time of war, there is one last thing. Even as we engage knowingly in the Great War, we cannot forget that the fighting is not all that there is. We must bear in mind that there will be art beyond this world this time. It is also a function of art, perhaps one of the greatest for the artist Christian, to foreshadow what is outside the circles of this world. Isaiah tells us there will be swords hammered into plowshares and no regret at the exchange. The things that we once used as survival tools will become tools for flourishing, nurturing, tending, and cultivation. Consider what this means. The tools we have used for making art to muster our fellow sojourners to bravery and perseverance will be the tools that we use to participate in the new creation. This includes our wounds and our losses. Do you think he will forget them? Even a burden as leaden as anxiety will have its uses. Sometimes my heart leaps to think what it will be like to have all the sensitive heightened awareness without the dread, to be used for finding delight in the good and the glory of my king. We get a beautiful glimpse of what is coming through Eowyn's turn after the War of the Ring. In the Houses of Healing, upon the first word of kindness from Faramir, the text says, she did not answer, but as he looked at her, it seemed to him that something in her softened, as though a bitter frost were yielding at the first faint presage of spring. And then a little bit later, Faramir reveals to Eowyn what she didn't even know about herself, that she had loved Aragorn because he was high and puissant, and you wish to have renown and glory and to be lifted far above the mean things that crawl on the earth. But when he gave you only understanding and pity, then you desired to have nothing unless a brave death in battle. And that's when he also confesses that he loves her. Then the heart of Eowyn changed or else at last she understood it. I rather think she understood it. And suddenly her winter passed and the sun shone on her. I stand in Minas Anor, the tower of the sun, she said, and behold, the shadow has departed. I will be a shield maiden no longer, nor vie with the great riders, nor take joy only in the songs of slaying. I will be a healer and love all things that grow and are not barren. 
Eowyn's renouncement is a declaration that her identity will no longer be drawn from fighting. She lives in a warring culture, but when all is said and done, she does not have a ceaselessly warring spirit. Tolkien says the same. He says, she was not herself ambitious in the true political sense. Though not a dry nurse in temper, she was also not really a soldier or Amazon, but like many brave women, was capable of great military gallantry at a crisis. I love this picture that he gives of what happens after the war to people who have been engaged in it. And like Heidi White mentioned at the beginning of this conference, this is a picture of restoration. And sometimes we can feel the lack of how little we know about that time. So I love this image. We too are not a people meant to be at war forever. So this is something for us to hold to, the vision of wholeness and the days that are coming, which we sometimes glimpse when we are caught unawares. That's both what we need to hold to and to hold out. In the years since that conversation on the terrace, I've tried not to shy away from confronting suffering and pointing to the source of our hope in my corner of the world. Sometimes I know I've done what was required because people are kind enough to tell me that it was useful to them. But sometimes I get quite tired. I lift my eyes from the page and I wonder what I'll have to write about in the day when all of us will be freed from fear and anxiety and war and disease and sin. I wonder if I will know what to do in a space that is no longer riddled with these things, having become accustomed to addressing them and living with them for so long. But it's becoming clearer to me that fighting is not the core of my identity either. Instead, the further I get, the more I find that the word at the core is beloved. Nothing that I have fashioned, nothing that I can preserve, only a deep, deep love that is teaching me how to hold the outworking of redemption and training my eyes to hold a homeward gaze. For some day, we will be home. We will be more than the sum of our scars. And we will walk with him and discover more there than we ever thought possible. Discover, no doubt, that there was more here than we ever thought possible. The hard-won battles and skirmishes will be past. And he will dwell with us and be our God and our light. And it may be that the songs sung in the streets and the byways and the open spaces of the New Jerusalem will be like the songs of the elves. We will sing lays of deeds past that highlight not so much our feats as the all-imbuing faithfulness of our King. That day is coming faster than we know, even as it calls to us like the sound of the sea, or what Frodo saw after his ship passed on into the west. At last, at last, on a night of rain, he smelled a sweet fragrance on the air and heard the sound of singing that came over the water. And then it seemed to him that the great rain curtain turned all to silver glass and was rolled back, and he beheld white shores and beyond them a far green country under a swift sunrise. You shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace, Isaiah has told us. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. But until then, to borrow the words of C.S. Lewis, meanwhile the cross comes before the crown, and tomorrow is a Monday morning. A cleft has opened in the pitiless walls of the world, and we are invited to follow our great captain inside. The following him is, of course, the essential point. When Monday sun rises, may it find us with our feet standing firm and the first to last of our skills engaged wherever the Lord of hosts leads each one of us. And may it be that even as we do so, even as we do battle, we begin to hear a percussive prelude to a new hymn, the bright tolling sound of hammer upon anvil, of sword points and spear tips making fresh furrows in a new earth, the imminent dawn bell of a kingdom renewed. Thank you for joining me here.